Hello, New Heights. As always, I consider an honor to be here with you. Um, I always mention to Nuevas Alturas that it's an opportunity to show that we are one church when the campus pastors come to Nuevas Alturas to share the Word of God. And I tell them, and sometimes they take the risk to invite me to share the Word of God with them. <laughs> and so here I am. And since this is the last service, I feel a little bit more freedom that I know that there's not other service next and so I have a little more time. I want to <laughs> share something else. He talks about the camps and youth and all that. And I, it's something that is in my heart. I feel very grateful. Since we joined New Heights, one of our desires was to have our youth to integrate with New Heights. And at the beginning, it was very hard. Our, our youth uh, didn't want to be part of it. They felt like, no, I wouldn't want to be part of it. I, I don't know if we we're going to be accepted. And I remember having my kids, I, I had to force them to go to the first, their first camp. And they said, no, I don't want to go. And I told them, okay, this first camp, you're going to go because I'm telling you. I'm your dad, so you're going to go. <laughs> and if you don't like it, after your experience, if you don't like it, next year... I'm not gonna, gonna for, I'm not gonna force you to go, but this first one, you're going. And so they went. After that first camp, they cannot wait for the next camp, and next camp, and next camp, and next camp. And so now, I feel so grateful because this camp, not we, we don't only have more kids from I and I coming to the camps, but we have. Kids participating as volunteers. We have more youth participating as leaders. And we received the news uh, from uh, Justin, uh, the, the, the guy who runs the camps, that uh, INA provided more leaders from parents for the camps. And so that, to me, integration, I love it. You know? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So... Five congregations, one church, two languages. And I love that. I'm truly grateful. Since we joined New Heights, this has been an overwhelming experience for me as a pastor and for Nuevas Alturas. And so today I want to share a topic with you that I shared with, with INA not too long ago. And in a series I call Ordinary Lives, Extraordinary Intervention. And I name the talk in search of a word. And if we're honest, we should realize that we are insignificant beings before a God who has created all things, who is powerful, all-powerful, and furthermore, who is perfectly holy in nature. If we reflect for a moment in who, on who God is and who we are, we should be in, that should be enough to generate in us a sense of humility. Because being who we are and despite what we have done, our God through Jesus gives us the enormous privilege to come into Him. He remembers that we are dust and He understands us in our weaknesses. That's why through Jesus we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Unfortunately, even if we, for a period of time we may keep a passion to seek God and a strong desire to hear His Word, we are creatures of routine and it's easy for us to become used to things and lose appreciation of them. We can come to a point in our lives where we do things routinely. We do that in our daily basis. For example, when we buy a new car, we get so excited, but a year goes by, and not even a year, even just a few months, and we start losing interest. Because something new comes on, something better, we say. And what about when we start a new relationship? We get so excited that we can't even hang up the phone. We are so desperate to go to our date. But then, we get married. 
and you know the rest. <laughs> and that's just the reality. Well, that happens too in our spiritual lives. And we should ask, what attitude should I have when coming to God? What is that truly drives me to come to church? What do I want to accomplish? What am I seeking? What's the purpose of coming every Sunday? When we observe the religious life in the times of Jesus, we quickly notice that there were people that did everything expected from them. But Jesus told them that their heart, hearts were far from God. How can we prevent that same, the same thing from happening to us? Today, I want us to look of a passage in, G in John chapter 4, verses 43 to 53. Because I think that in the experience of the men in this story, we find what needs to be our attitude when coming to God's presence. We will be gradually discovering the story within this passage, but first, I want us to observe the given scripture. First, Jesus' journey all the way to Galilee. Verses 43 and 44. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself have pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Jesus had just crossed through the city of Samaria where he had stayed for two days. That's where he had that well-known encounter with the Samaritan woman. The context is on the same chapter, but verses 3 and 4. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. He had been in Judea first for the Passover festival, but from there he decided to make a trip to Galilee. But first, it was necessary for him to pass through Samaria, Samaria to meet with the Samaritan woman and transform her life forever. Now he's in Galilee, where he has been previously and made his first miracle, turning water into wine. And now Jesus mentions some surprising words. A prophet has no honor in his own country. Let's remember that Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem of Judea, but because of the king's edict where he ordered to kill all baby boys under two years old, an angel revealed a warning to Joseph, Mary's husband, so they fled. And so Jesus was raised in the city of Nazareth. And that is why Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth. So here, Jesus is referring to those who saw him growing up. And it will be harder for them to believe that he was the Messiah. Right after he says these words, it could seem like a surprise that Jesus is will receive by the Galilees. Verses 45 and 46. When he arrives in Galilee... The Galileans welcome him. They have seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also have been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When he makes it to Cana in Galilee, he finds some Jews that had also traveled to, Jeru to Jerusalem of Judea to partake of the, fest the Passover festival. These people had witnessed the miracles that Jesus had made there. So they were very happy to receive him. But not because they had believed in him, but because of the miracles they have seen him do. We see the context of that in chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believing his name. But Jesus will not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. They were very likely excited for the idea that Jesus had come to make some miracles among them. 
But it's very important to say the following. There is a big difference between wanting miracles and wanting the one who makes the miracles. It is important to mention that miracles are like signs, and signs have a specific purpose. They point us to something, a place, or a destination. And in this case, the purpose of the miracles was to point them to a person. The purpose of the miracles was so that they could see Jesus. The objective is not the miracles in themselves. If we experience a miracle, but we don't have the one to whom the miracle is pointing us to, we have missed the most important. We miss Jesus. These men were amazed at the miracles, but they were not yet capable of seeing what these miracles were pointing to. How can I make this claim? Because a little bit further down in this account, Jesus will confront them with the reality that they had no interest in him, but only in his miracles. All right, once in Galilee, a man comes to meet with Jesus. And what was this man's need? The second part of verse 46 says it. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. His need was having a seriously sick son. His name is not mentioned. It only mentions his position or role within the Roman government. And because of the description given, we can come to the conclusion that the, his role was administrative in nature. He had a high rank, therefore he had many servants in his charge and a great wealth. wealth. But he found himself in a situation that not even his high rank position nor his great wealth could resolve. We could deduce that before seeking Jesus, this man had attempted it all. But now he found himself in an extremely desperate situation. His son was about to die. Verse 47. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee for Judea, from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. And I want, I want to emphasize the words, when this man heard. This means that Jesus' fame had reached his ears. He heard that Jesus had made several miracles. And in his desperation, he was willing to go out and search for Jesus. It wasn't common or appropriate that a man like him, of his position belonging to royalty, would go out to look for help from a carpenter known as Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't considered correct that a man of his position would ask for help from an inferior social class. The normal thing to do was that those from a lower class will ask for help from those in the royal class. Those in the royal class were used to hear the pleas and requests from the poor, but that someone from the high class to seek help, and furthermore, furthermore that he will beg someone in the lower class, what? What about your reputation? What will be said about you after that? But this man's love for his son was such that he didn't stop to think about his position, rank, or social status. This man not only came to Jesus, but he begged him. He could have sent a delegation of servants to ask Jesus to come to his home, but he didn't. This man had many responsibilities and commitments, but he understood that now his main priority was to meet with Jesus. And as Christians, we want extraordinary interventions from God in our lives. But have we understood our need for Jesus? We want to feel those spiritual emotions, but have we come to the point where we acknowledge that meeting Jesus needs to be our main priority? Why wait until something in our lives is about to die? 
Many do not place importance in a passionate life for Jesus. As if they are waiting for their marriage to come to the point of death. When they are on the verge of divorce, that's when they want to react. And why wait for their relationship between our children and God to reach a point where it appears to be death? We don't react. We don't want to have a passionate interest in God and His work. It is as if we are waiting for our children to be heading down the wrong path when they already don't have any interest in God. Only until then, only then is when we want to react. And certainly, the same thing happens when, with our own personal relationship with God. We don't seek Him as if we are waiting for our soul to dry out completely. So, we need to understand our need for Jesus. We need to make Jesus our main priority. The royal official was from Capernaum and traveled all the way to Cana to meet Jesus. So now, from Capernaum to Cana, there was a distance of about 22 miles. And to hear 22 miles within our context, we might think it is just a short distance and easy to travel. But remember that in those days, there weren't means of transportation as we have them today. Besides from Capernaum to Cana, they had to cross a mountain range. And the territory in those places is very rocky, so that even when traveling by horse or carriage, it was rather complicated. A trip that in our days will be of about 20 minutes, in those circumstances, it will be a journey that will take hours. The fact is, that when we understand our need for Jesus, and when we make Jesus our main priority, we are willing to do anything in order to meet with Jesus. But when we don't acknowledge our need for Him, and only pretend that our life is okay, it is then when we start to lose interest in Him. It is then when everything that has to do with God seems hard, we, fi we find fault in everything or fi find excuses for everything. We can start saying, oh, I'm so tired, or it is too far, or right now I have a lot of work. We can almost use anything as an excuse. But what we see in this man's example is that he f was fully conscious of his need and made Jesus his main priority. For that reason, there was no obstacle, there was no reason or excuse that stopped him from seeking Jesus. Then, Jesus decides to use the same encounter with this man to confront the other people around them. Jesus confronts the people for their lack of interest in him. Verse 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, just told him, you will never believe. Right in the middle of the interaction with this man, Jesus said these words. And why do I dare say that the, Jesus did, didn't utter this phrase because of this man, but because of those who had already been witness of some of his miracles in the Passover festival? Because this man had already given Jesus several pieces of evidence of his faith. But for the many people, Jesus not entrusted himself to them because he knew all people. Because they were only in search of miracles, but had no interest in him. In fact, afterwards, in chapter 6, when Jesus confronted a large multitude that was following him, the text says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why did that happen? 
because the great majority of them were interested in the signs, but not interested in the one whom the signs pointed to. And so, we come to the climax of this narration. One word from Jesus is enough when there is faith. Verses 49 and 50. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied. Your son will live. The man took Jesus as his word and departed. So let's see. This man understood his need for Jesus. He made Jesus his main priority. And that was exactly what placed him in the perfect place to receive a word from Jesus. Because Jesus' word is enough to transform an ordinary life. Spectacular experiences are not needed or radiant moments. What we need is a word from Jesus, and that will be enough. So why attempting to have a solid relationship with God? Or why do we come to church? If we will only come with the attitude of longing to receive a word from God. Because then, just like these men, nothing will stop us. No reason or excuse that will hinder our desire to meet with Jesus. Loved ones, God has a word for each one of us through his word the Bible. Every time we come to church, we have the opportunity to listen to His Word. That needs to be our motivation. I long to hear His Word. I want God's Word for me. And not only when we come to church, but every time we approach the Bible, the Word of God. May we say, like the psalmist, my soul thirsts for God. So why do we lose motivation? Because little by little, we get used to a simple religious practice and we stop longing that God speaks to our heart. In this man's case, Jesus spoke a word and he believed. For him, it was enough to listen to Jesus' word. This man did as Jesus told him, and he returned home. And this, too, teaches us something very important. When God speaks to us through his word, it is necessary that we obey. Because as Christians, we long for extraordinary interventions, but when we hear God's word, what do we do with it? How do we expect God to continue to reveal his word to us when we don't obey when he already has clearly revealed us his word? I'm not talking about hearing God's word audibly. I'm talking about his word, the Bible. We can come to, the church, to church every Sunday or we can approach the word of God every day for years. But if we don't believe and obey his word, why should we expect him to continue to reveal his word to us? For what reason? So that we can only be full of knowledge? But if we are willing to believe and obey when God reveals to us his word, then we will have understood that the fruit of faith comes as a result of obedience to Jesus' word, to God's word. And that was exactly what happened in this, this man's experience. Verses 51 through 53. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquires as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then 
the father realized that, his, that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believe. This man believed Jesus. His faith was so strong that Jesus' word was enough for him. He showed his, his faith by obeying Jesus. With no doubt, he returned home. When he got home, he saw the fruit of his faith because his faith was placed in Jesus' word. Faith in itself is powerless. In whom we are placing our faith, that's what makes the difference. I want to finish giving you some things to remember. The most important thing is not the signs, but the one whom the signs point to. We need to be able to put our eyes on Jesus. Set your eyes, fix your eyes on Jesus. We need to understand our need for Jesus. You know why? Because separate from him, we can do nothing. We need to make Jesus our main priority. God first. Love God with, lo with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Because then we will be able to receive an extraordinary intervention. God speaking to our life through his word. By his Holy Spirit, he will reveal his word to us every day and every time we come to church. So I ask again, why are we here at, ch at church today? Maybe this is a good moment to give our hearts to God. Maybe it is a good moment to tell him, I need an extraordinary intervention. I need your word to speak to my heart. And if we know deep inside of us that our connection with God is not what it needs to be, maybe this is a good moment to go back to the basics. Seeking God with a humble heart. Not allowing ourselves to let go one day without spending time with Him. And maybe it could be something very simple. Just by making a decision before approaching the Word of God every day. Or even before coming to church. God, I want you to speak to me. I want to have the right attitude. I need your word speak to me. I need you to help me. I want a strong desire for you. Nothing can be more important in my life than your word. Because I know that one word from you can be enough to transform an ordinary life like me. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you because it's not just like any other book. And, and we know, Lord, that sometimes we read like, like any other book. And we forget that your word is alive. And it has the power to transform our lives. And instead of just reading it like any other book, we need to remember that you can transform our lives anytime that we get exposed to it. In our devotionals or when we come to church. And it can be something very simple before coming to church when we get up. In the morning, just by simply a simple prayer, Lord, I want you to speak to me today. I know you have a word for me. 
because sometimes we make the mistakes when, when we come to church and we hear your word and no matter what, what the topic is we start hearing your word and we, we immediately think oh you know this is really good for my neighbor oh this is good for my husband or for my wife oh I wish my son could hear this but it's so simple and it's so practical longing that you can speak to me because your word has the power to transform an ordinary life and that ordinary life is me thank you for your word in Jesus name Amen